here with you. I hope you still have some blood in the brain because after the nice lunch, everything is in the stomach now and you don't fall asleep. Um, in, you know, Spain and France are close together and the French, what they say when a Spaniard speaks French, they say, you speak Spanish like, you speak French like a Spanish cow. I hope I don't speak English like a Spanish cow. Well, you know that the first cases of A were reported by CDC in 1981. And since then, we have more than 25 million deaths. It's called the most devastated human epidemic. I usually say something else. It's probably the most devastating infectious human epidemic because abortion is another epidemic that's sometimes not counted in the statistics. Since 1996 there is a highly active antiretroviral therapy but they are expensive. They have side effects, they produce resistance, so prevention is still the solution. And I know that uh, Mrs. Bush uh, gave some results, so I'm going to just fly on results, but we're speaking, this is uh, the last UNAIDS in, um, information in 2011, we're speaking of more than 2.5 million people newly infected by HIV every year. We're speaking of 1.7 million deaths every year. Um, as you can see here, um, prevalence is increasing. It's true that new cases are kind of decreasing, but we know that in some places in the world, incidence is still on the rise. Um, it's basically on the rise in male-to-male -male sexual contact, for example. Or in this figure, you can see that, that in Switzerland, it's kind of not um, lowering yet. Um, you know that one of the effects of AIDS is affecting the life expectancy uh, at birth. Uh, this is a tragedy because this, some countries like Malawi, if uh, when you're born it is expected you might be able to live until you're 38 because of, of AIDS. And we know that life expectancy was improving all over the world, but uh, beginning uh, the 80s, when AIDS appeared, all the life expectancies went down, except in one case, uh, Uganda, uh, uh, that was able to uh, change the tendency, and we'll see data on Uganda uh, later on. Now, uh, AIDS is not the only problem. We have chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HPV, and genital herpes, as, as uh, Frida Bush showed a while ago. Okay, I will be fast on these slides, not to repeat the data that you already saw a while ago. Chlamydia is increasing. Frida showed these slides. It's affecting especially girls from 15 to 24. Uh, gonorrhea is also kind of on the rise. Syphilis is on the rise, especially on men who have sex with men. And the ages of these men is uh, from 15, uh, 20 to 29. Human papilloma virus, if we look at the ages 20, 24, we're speaking of 40, 50 percent of sexually active uh, persons who are infected. Uh, these are data uh, from uh, the US and this is kind of a, a worrisome uh, figures. Um, genital warts are on the rise, herpes is on the rise, here we, we have a kind of a blip but the overall trend is on the rise and one of the things that has happened is if you look at the dark green as before and light green as more recently, one of the changes is when we ask people how many sexual partners they have had in their life before what was uh, very frequent was people saying zero, one sexual partner in my life. And now, 
what is prevailing is another type of person that's saying, well, five to nine, more than ten. So one of the things that are happening is there is an increase in lifetime sexual partners. We know that this is associated with a higher risk of infection. In this slide, you can see indeed that uh, herpes is increasing uh, when the number of lifetime partners is increasing. So uh, we know that, and that's a fact. This is a recent study published in British Medical Journal 2012. They make a, a multivariate analysis that they adjust for confounders and yet, you see that there is an 87% increase of risk of HPV on those people who have more than two sexual partners in their lifetime. So, we can summarize the problems in this slide. Sexually transmitted infections are still rising. On occasions, they are permanent. They can produce death, infertility, cancer, cirrhosis, adolescence greatly affected. Condoms are not highly affected, effective in the following STIs, HPV, herpes, and chlamydia. Um, what can we say on preventive measures? Preventive measures, uh, as you know, there's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is wanting to prevent new cases of infections. Its objective is to lower incidence and risk avoidance and risk reduction measures belong to primary prevention. Secondary prevention is early detection, screening, early treatment of existing cases. What secondary prevention is looking for is to lower prevalence. Tertiary prevention is treatment after diagnosis. It's looking for improving outcomes. Now, it, Primary prevention measures, as far as STIs are concerned, are sex education, the ABC approach, for example, that uh, wants abstinence, fidelity, and condom use for those who don't accept abstinence and fidelity. Voluntary counseling and testing, circumcision, vaccines, that's all in primary prevention. Secondary prevention, for example, is voluntary counseling and testing. Tertiary prevention, an example would be treatment in STD clinics. All measures are important, but when an infection can be chronic, such as what is happening with AIDS, there's no cure, uh, where we have more than 2 million new cases every year, this is a great burden. If you think of 2 million people every year who will have to begin treatment and have to take treatment the rest of their lives, that is a big burden, whatever the price of medication is. Primary prevention then becomes crucial in this in this case in these cases. Now, so we definitely need to prevent new cases of STI. We definitely want to lower incidence. But not only that, from a public health point of view, uh, we can ask ourselves: What do we really want for our children? For our children, what we really want for them is risk avoidance. We really want to avoid the risk on them. So, there, you know that there is a debate between risk avoidance and risk reduction, and this is one where I want to concentrate now. Risk avoidance means to completely avoid risk. It usually involves primary behavior changes, and this is the best situation and should be given priority. This is what we would want for our children. Risk reduction means that it reduces risks of inherently risky behaviors, it usually involves technological solutions. There is an importance here of segmentation of messages in public health. What does this mean? When the first studies on wine consumption and um, cardiovascular disease appear, WHO said, don't tell the whole population that wine is good for your health. Why? Because we would end up having problems due to alcohol consumption. That would be a population uh, way of giving information. WHO, uh, WHO said you should speak individually to patients, patients with cardiovascular risk, and to that patient. Tell that patient that drinking wine every day could be good for his or her health. That's another way of giving the information. That's what we call segmentation of public health information. Now you will see that what WHO is okay for wine doesn't seem that they are okay 
for condom use, and this is a paradox. So risk compensation is a real problem when we are speaking of risk reduction. In fact, look at this article that appeared in 2006, <coughs> New England Journal of Medicine. Conclusion of the article is, among newly sexually active women, consistent condom use by their partners appears to reduce the risk of cerv cerv cervical and vulvovaginal HPV infection. And I usually tell my students, is this what you would tell your daughter of 14 year old? Is this what you would tell your daughter? Let's see the results of the study. In the results of the study, you can see that um, those uh, girls whose partners used condoms in less than 5% of the occasions, they had an 89% risk of getting infected from HPV. Whereas those girls whose partners were 100% using condoms in 100% of occasions, 38% got infected. What does this mean? This means that that conclusion is true. Condoms reduce the risk from 89 to 38. But the other part of the conclusion is missing. Condoms are not effective to avoid infection from HPV. Because even in the 100% users, out of 100, 38 got infected. And this is a problem of public health. We might want to say both things to our door. I would rather continue until the end because I have difficulties with English and... Uh, with this slide, what about 5 to 49%? How can you have 159% getting HPV? Uh, this is... Uh, can I uh, end, end, end the, the presentation because I need to be really concentrated on the, on the, <laughs> la the language. English is not my, my, my language. Okay. Uh, so, um, as we said, risk compensation can be a real problem. What is risk compensation? Definition of risk comp compensation is that people may increase risk-taking behaviors if they perceive themselves to be at less risk due to a technological preventive measure. This behavioral disinhibition is called risk compensation because the benefits of an intervention designed to reduce risk can be offset by this increase in risk taking. Examples are sunscreen use and skin cancer. You could find more skin cancer in users of sunscreen use or seat belts and reckless driving or football players, American football players and the protections they use. Let's just, I'm just going to say something about the sunscreen use and skin cancer as an example. If you tell people to use sunscreen <laughs> And that's it, technological solution. Sunscreen is not 100% effective. They, will, they could use sunscreen and be in the sun 10 hours a day. The fact of being 10 hours a day under the sun, even if they use a sunscreen, will be so strong that it will compensate the possibility of protection from uh, the sunscreen. And those people could end up having skin cancer. In this slide, I'm trying to summarize this issue. If a government, for example, uh, does condom promotion with the good idea of wanting to decrease HIV spread, but it does it with a safe sex message, meaning do whatever you want as long as you use condoms, or with the message that condoms are 100% effective, then risk compensation comes in. And this condom promotion program could end up increasing the spread of HIV or any infection. Let me uh, explain this in this slide. Um, this is the increase of the probability of transmission of the AIDS virus. It increases as you increase the number of sexual contacts. In blue is people who do not use condoms. What happens when these people use condoms? Condoms will reduce the, the risk of infection, but will never bring the risk to zero. And this reduction um, looks good, but if the campaign is done without considering behavior, this is what can happen. Young people that do not have sex can feel 
un, uh, not vulnerable and they can decide to start having sex, they will go from zero risk to some risk. Young people who have some sexual partners might end up having more than some sexual partners and they will have a given risk, they will go to a higher risk. For example, here, if this person here before had 20 sexual contacts uh, without a condom, but now, because of risk compensation, that person has 70 sexual contacts with a condom, the fallacy is, the paradox is, that he ends up having the same risk. And this is a problem of risk compensation. Now, we can say that the risk of HIV, the risk of HIV is low in our setting, not in Africa, in our setting. It is low, but the risk of HIV in five sexual relationships with condoms is equal to the risk of HIV in one sexual relationship without a condom. And this is the problem of risk compensation. Now, um, there have been community trials that have seen what happens when you have a campaign promoting condom use and a control group, they found that yes, there is an increase of condom use in the group that was in the treatment group that received the condom uh, information, but they also observed a higher number of multiple partnership and that's when risk compensation can come in. Um, I want to speak now about sex education and the ABC approach. Uh, you know that the ABC approach uh, is, this is not, uh, it's not a moral teaching, this, uh, there's, there's a consensus uh, signed by different researchers in The Lancet in 2004, and ABC approach means A, abstinence, delay the age of your sexual initiation as the 100% effective way of avoiding AIDS, and B is be faithful, which in public health we don't use the, the word fidelity. In public health, fidelity is more difficult to say. We say mutual monogamy with an uninfected person. It's like very tiring to say fidelity in public health, but that's what it is. Mutual monogamy. And that is risk avoiding. And condom use, if you do not accept A and B, but you should know that B is best for you, uh, condom use may reduce risk. Now, you know that this is a very controversial topic. When Pope Benedict said that he didn't think condom use was the solution to the problem of Africa, I don't know what happened here in the US, but in Spain there was a national vomit. Uh, they were just outraged and people were really, really stressed by this. Uh, but in the Washington Post, somebody like Edward Green um, said, well, um, Given the data, the data I am studying, the Pope may be right, which is interesting. What is the evidence on condom effectiveness? You know that Cochrane says that consistent use of condom results in an 80% reduction in HIV incidence. Now here we have a problem. This is epidemiology. It's a relative reduction of 80%. It does not mean they are 80% effective or 20% not effective. This is a difficult issue and sometimes it's difficult to convey this information to the public. Let me try to explain what this really means. It's a relative reduction of 80%. In different studies, meta-analysis reviewing different studies on condom effectiveness, the, what we know is that 100 couples discordant couples, one is infected, the other is not infected, that have sex during one year, the results show that 5.7 will be infected. The AIDS virus is a low, has a low infectivity compared to HPV, for example. Now, if those 100 couples during that year used condoms consistently, the risk would be reduced in 80%, which means we need to take away 80% of 5.7%. In other words, we're left with 1.14%. That is the effectiveness of condoms for AIDS transmission in terms of probability. So don't get confused by this 80%. It doesn't mean they're 20% not effective. 
they are 1.14% not effective. But why are we still arguing against this? Well, because we're speaking of something that's not 100% effective, and the infection is serious. In Italy, there was a, 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 the milk Nestle for babies. At one point, there was a, not a batch of milk that the ink of Nestle went inside. They eliminated the whole batch from sale. There was no risk of disease nor death, but just the fact that they knew that ink came in the milk, they would eliminate it. What would happen if the milk had a 1.14% of uh, transmitting something serious? So it seems like we understand probabilities differently. If we're speaking of milk for babies, condoms, this is another interesting issue. The probability of infection ends up being accumulative. Of course, the study may be made one year, but what happens when in the lifetime you're having different sexual relationships? There are problems like slippage and rupture that are more frequent in youth. We know also that condoms are 85% effective to avoid pregnancies, and they are not as effective preventing some STIs as chlamydia, herpes, and HPV. We have to see this whole problem in this context. So, this article, uh, you probably all read it, American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Do you pronounce it McIlany or McIlany? Difficult for me to pronounce. Okay. <laughs> so, condoms offer inadequate protection for three of the most common sexually transmitted infections, papilloma, herpes, and chlamydia. I mean, we know this also. Spain is the champion of condom use in Europe. We do not have a problem of knowledge or availability. We do not. This is European data. Spain is up here. 95% of girls, 83% of boys, 15-year-olds who used a condom at the last sexual intercourse. We do not have a problem. We are the champion of condom use in Europe. And yet, Spain has a problem of increasing uh, gonorrhea, syphilis, um, of chlamydia, there is a problem. What is the evidence on ABC approach? You know that uh, the first results on ABC came out um, in this USAID um, document that's called What Happened in Uganda? In Uganda, they realized that the prevalence of AIDS was decreasing rapidly in different areas of Uganda, not just in one area, and they thought, oh well, it must be that in Uganda they use more condoms. And when they started comparing condom use, they realized that the use of condoms in males in Uganda was similar to Zambia, lower than Malawi. They realized it was not an issue of condom use. They started uh, looking on the data and they looked at uh, delayed sexual initiation among 13, 16 year olds, and indeed the change from 94 to 2001 was that sexual initiation both in boys and girls was greatly decreased. This is the A approach of the ABC. Then they also checked on casual sex and also in males and females, urban and rural, there was a decrease of casual sex. This is also A recommendation. Then they checked on uh, percent reporting a non-regular partner in the last 12 months. And this is the situation of Uganda, and this is the situation of the other countries. This is the B approach. So uh, they ended up saying that the prevalence decline in Uganda related more to the reduction in sex partners than condom use. And in this slide, you can see that the incidence was lowered before the increase of condom use in Uganda. Uh, not only in Uganda, in many other places the same results started coming up. Uh, here you can see in Zimbabwe that there was a low rate of percentages of 17, 19 year olds who have started sex, of not, uh, new sexual partners in the last year, and casual partners. Condom use was more or less stable. So it seems to be that A and B are being uh, more important in these uh, countries. 
Now, there was a BMJ article saying that partner reduction is crucial for balance, a balanced ABC approach to HIV prevention. Here, in the US, I think you're better off. In Spain, politicians, whether from the right or from the left, they have panic. They will never say anything about A nor B. It's just not acceptable for them to say anything about this. It's interesting because uh, we don't use the word promiscuity. We use the word multiple partnership. But if you use when people years ago they used to say promiscuity, then in some places of Africa they would say, I'm not promiscuous. That's why the word is ambiguous and it's moralizing, right? I'm not promiscuous. I have sex with a lady from Monday to Friday, and on Saturday and Sunday I have sex with another uh, lady. And I'm, this is my sex life for nine years, so I'm not technically promiscuous. I am be monogamous, so to say. But be monogamous, right? I'm monogamous to two ladies, depending on the days of the week. Now, uh, they started studying the sexual contacts in different places. And here is our guy who's being monogamous, right? <laughs> Monday to Friday with this lady, and Saturday and Sunday with this lady. The issue is that if this guy here uh, has a commercial sex type of relationship, that infection due to this network will end up reaching this by monogamous, so-called monogamous male. So this is the multiple partnership is a very interesting issue that we need to talk about. Now, if you ask people in Spain, only 45% of the population knows that having few partners is a good idea to prevent AIDS and STIs. It's not a Spanish problem. Uh, this is in Lesotho, and they think wearing gloves <laughs> is better than faithfulness. So it's an international problem. Now, I don't have the data on the US, but it would be interesting to find out. <laughs> Population versus individual strategies, I spoke to you about this a while ago. The problem is our kids are influenced by different uh, media campaigns. They are a big issue. This is Germany, and when to stop AIDS, in the word stop, they put um, wedding ring. Or this condom that says, safe sex, what is safe sex? Get married and be faithful. It's not the same that your child sees this kind of stuff. This is another example. In addition to preventing AIDS, fidelity will prevent you from having broken love pictures and letters. That's one approach. Now, this is Spain. If you make love, and the O of love is condom, or 0% of risk, and this is terrible, I understand, we would not be able to put this here in the US. If you use this in the US, you would be probably sued because you're not giving the right information. But in the US, even if they don't put these signs, maybe some messages are being given meaning the same thing. That's something we need to, to know more about. Now, this is also Spain, right? Sex, it's a therapy. It's a therapy. We need to close all the CVS of the country. If this morning you feel a little bit uh, not okay, you can get a sexual therapy. You know, I mean, it's relaxing, good for your heart, antidepressive. And for the males, oh, it's good for your prostate cancer. I mean, it's incredible. In other words, you can do whatever you want in sex as long as you do it with condoms. This is a very dangerous information because very surely risk compensation will be coming back. This is Uruguay. Now Uruguay is do it well. Use a condom. What's doing it well? Using a condom. What you do with whom? It doesn't matter as long as you do it with a condom. So this is happening uh, all over the world. This is also Spain. S AIDS can cross your way. 
It's interesting. It's like you're walking in the street and suddenly AIDS <laughs> crosses your way. Or is it you that can cross the way of AIDS by making some personal choices in your life? And this is incredible for a democratic country. We are all the same in front of AIDS. It's not like we're all the same by the law. No. We're all the same in front of AIDS. Uh, of course, uh, in a sense, this is true, in the sense that if you're tourism in Kenya, you have an accident, that they transfuse your blood, and you could have bad luck, and you could end up with blood badly controlled. In that sense, we're all the same. But we know that there are some lifestyles that are dangerous, others that are not. It's your choice. Your choice. It depends on your free choice. Now, how should the information be conveyed? I suggest we do the same thing that we are proposed to do concerning alcohol consumption. We should distinguish two situations. Situation one, persons living a stable and dangerous lifestyle, low feasibility of change, example, commercial sex. First, we use a personal communication channel Second, we always have to inform on risk avoidance. Why? They also have the right to know what is best for them. Then, we can inform on risk reduction. But making it clear, we're not speaking about their ideal situation. It's, it's an, another issue. Now, persons with no risk of or taking occasional risks never recommend condom use and give priority and emphasis to risk avoidance. What's happening in some countries? Some international agency, the AIDS establishment, they give exactly the same message to who's working on commercial sex or a 13-year-old kid. Use a condom. But I don't have sex. It's okay. Use a condom. But I'm a virgin. Use it as a hat. But use a condom. <laughs> of course. Um, that's a problem. That's a problem. There is no segmentation of information. This came out on last year on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. Young Spaniards are not afraid of sexually infectious diseases. My question is why are they not afraid? Maybe we're giving them the wrong message. And this article is in your package. And I want to just say a few words about this article we published in Archives of Sexual Behavior. It's mean age of first sex. Do they know what we mean? Because, um, oops, sorry about that. Press the wrong button. All right. Very often in the media, they say, the average age of sexual initiation is 16 year old. What happens when a 16 year old kid sees that title? He thinks kids his age, 16, are sexually initiated. And yet, that is a statistical, uh, there's a statistical problem with that average. Why? Average age of sexual initiation is calculated only among kids who are sexually initiated. It doesn't take into account the guy of 19, 20, 21, 22, who still hasn't had sex. And it gives the kids a wrong uh, feeling that they are not normal. So in this article, what we do is that we prove with data, and you can try any data on the world with kids between 14 and 18, and you will see that the average has nothing to do with meaning that the majority are sexually active. This is the average of Spain, 16. And how many 16 are sexually active? 22%. This is the average of Peru. These are rep representative samples of the three countries. 14. How many 14-year-olds are sexually active in Peru? 9.6%. This is a big issue. Why? A 14-year-old kid in Peru who sees this in a newspaper title thinks that the majority of the kids their age are sexually active. 
And it's very important when we try to convey the message of delayed sexual initiation to make them feel they are okay. The majority of your age are not sexually active. We have, we are going to publish now the results of, you were mentioning, I don't know how many tries for publishing your data. This one that we're publishing now, we tried nine times because we also are biased. We have a Catholic bias. So I responded to them saying, um, I have a PhD in epidemiology and I didn't find in my book any bias called Catholic bias. Please explain with detail what is the bias? What happened to the odds ratio? Did it go up, down, and why? Explain please. <laughs> so, uh, we show that this is true, that kids, we, we did a test with our students. They are older students. They study statistics. We show them this average, and indeed, they think that means that the majority are sexually active. So now, this paper is, is going to come out soon. Comprehensive sex education, what can we say about this? Well, these are my guys. Uh, this is, if you read Hemingway, this is the fiesta, this is crazy. Uh, I never run the bulls like that. They say if you get married with somebody from Pamplona, you need to run the bull once. Well, I am the p-value 0.05. I'm married with a girl from Pamplona and I have never run the bulls. I'm not that crazy yet. but. Okay, this is a very dangerous place. It's the entrance of the bull ring. Very dangerous. In fact, look at that. His life is threatened. This is like a Gillette blade. When the bull makes like that, he has a half a ton. When he does that, this is really, really serious. He's happy. <laughs> he is happy. Now, females are more perceptive. She's like, <laughs> she's happy, but she realizes something dangerous is happening. But he's happy. Now, on the next slide, somebody fell down. That's very dangerous. Why? People run like this because they're looking at the ball. They won't see that that person fell down. You will fall down on top. Another, 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 and a wall like this of people falling on top of each other uh, just gets there and the bulls, they will just advance. So it's, it's a tragic, tragedy. How is he? Oh, he is in ecstasy. What's the problem? He doesn't know what he's doing. And this is what we should avoid our kids, to our kids. They need to get the information, and they have to make free choices. I don't know here, but in my country, I'm sure that happens here too. In my country, some kids can go to the clinic, med internal medicine, the doctor tells them, you know what, I have to give you bad news, you're HIV positive. And the kid says, that's impossible. You're probably examining the wrong blood. Why are you saying that? And the kid responds, because I always use condoms. Who told that kid that always using condoms, you are risk-free? That is a problem of, of free choice. You cannot make a free choice if you're badly informed. So sex education, you know that there are different options. There is no sex education. There's a so-called comprehensive sex education. There's abstinence-only sex education. And there's abstinence-centered sex education. Now. What happens with no sex education? Well, the problem with no sex education is that we are sexual beings. It's one of our dimensions. It's not something we keep in the drawer and then suddenly we take it out to use it. No, we are males and females, whatever we do. So we have a problem if there is no sexual education. What can we say about the comprehensive sex education? Well, these are the characteristics. Programs include all types of information, biology, family planning, condom information. Character education is not always included, which is interesting. Sometimes people say, oh, teaching patients is not sex education. Of course it is. That is sex education. How do you think that person would be sexually if that person is impatient? 
that person is a problem, sexually speaking, if it's a, they, she, he, she is an impatient person. I call that kind of education veterinarian sexual education or plumbing sexual education. It's like, okay, this you connect this with that and that's how it works. It's the how, not the why. There's no reflection on why. All options are usually presented as equally valid and this is obviously not evidence-based because it's not evidence-based to say they are all equally valid. There is usually no distinction between avoidance or reduction and risk compensation is a great risk. Uh, this is uh, results I'm showing you. We're not finished with this paper yet. We're still fighting with reviewers. But this is, a, it, it, of course, it's a cross-sectional study with more than 8,000 kids. And we see that those who believe that condoms are 100% effective have a higher uh, prevalence of having had sex already, of being sexually initiated. What we do here is that we recalculate everything, taking into account different situations. And there is a remarkable consistency of higher sex initiation among those who believe uh, condoms are 100% effective. Now, this is a cross-sectional study, has disadvantages. We are going to repeat this analysis with a follow-up uh, follow data. How about abstinence-only sex education? Well, the problem with abstinence-only sex education is that they are hearing something else in the media. That could be a problem. And some people say, what happens when they do have sex? What happens with abstinence-centered sex education? Abstinence-centered sex, centered sex education, they include all types of information, biology, family planning, economy information, same as so-called comprehensive sex education, but character education is crucial, it's with self-efficacy, helping them make the choice of not having sex. And all options are not presented as equally valid. Risk avoidance is a priority and the goal of that program. And they use sentences such as this one. If you make the mistake of having sex, then you should know that condoms may reduce your risk. But it is clear it is a mistake to have sex. Okay? The, the, the message is not unclear. There is evidence, this was published in the Journal of Adolescent Health, and they show in this paper that, uh, yes, uh, the uh, cohort that uh, used uh, comparing Teen Star, for example, with the control group, there was a significant protection of uh, sexual behavior and sexual risk. Now, why am I showing this? Not for you to read because it's a bad slide, but it's to show you that now UN AIDS are starting to pick up information from all countries about percent of young people 15, 19 years old having had sex before age 15, or abortion having sex with more than one partner in the last 12 months, and condom use. Years ago, UN AIDS would only give information on condom use. Now, they seem to realize that these other variables are important variables, and even if they don't say it loudly, when they collect data from countries, they are starting to pick up that information and they give it to you, which means that there is an official change. This is the book uh, that's, uh, uh, that Mary was speaking about, Affirming Love, Avoiding AIDS. Uh, it, it started with a Spanish book and it was also translated into French. The French are very romantic. It's love in the in front of, of AIDS. It's really a romantic title. <laughs> Only the French are capable of doing this. And maybe I would like to end with this slide. Uh, you know, if in developing countries they are, they have had success with not a lot of money, with signs like this one, I have a hard time thinking that us, with all the money we have, wouldn't be able to do things to change, right? 
Um, this is a challenge, but we have the same challenge with smoking. We didn't say, oh, smoke with a filter. We didn't do that. We started making campaigns to help kids not smoke. We were convinced they had to stop smoking. The same should be done concerning sexuality, but are we ready for this? I get nervous when I see some results analyzing sex education programs. This is a very difficult issue, and those who are against abstinence, they usually use studies to speak against abstinence, and they say things like, this program was not successful. But is that the right question? Can we study sex education programs like we study uh, medicine for heart attack, heart attack? I mean, how can a six hour sex education program change your way of thinking? If your television says the opposite, if when you go to the movie they say the opposite, if in your house they're not giving you the same, in your home, your family the same message, if the campaigns uh, are bringing you towards sex, so it's more difficult than just giving six hours of sex education program. We need to do a lot more. Let's go back to that slide. You know what? Um, usually, I used to give the results of this paper using um, just saying that the data without showing tables. And I myself am surprised with this table. Uh, maybe Joe, you can help me, but what's the issue here? 159, well, it's a rate. It's a rate, right. It's not a proportion. It's a rate, and rates can be above 100%. It's not a proportion. These are rates, okay? The issue is, the way you should understand this is just that the larger the, this amount, the faster you get infected. It's, a, it's, it's like speed you have 120 kilometers per hour. The rate is like a speed. It can be over 100. It means how fast you get infected. So what this really means is that even if condom use is 100%, you do have a risk of getting infected. And that's what you want to tell your, your daughter. Um, okay, let me go back. And there was an agreement. 
What happened after in Uganda is that they started um, shifting to the condom uh, uh, message and uh, HIV started to go up again, which is interesting. But now there is a, around 10 countries that have followed that path and who have done better with HIV. In fact, given the data, we could say the following. There is no country with a generalized HIV epidemic that has lowered the epidemic with a campaign centered on condom promotion. There is no such country. All the countries who have succeeded have had a strong A, B message. That is why the Pope was right. Also, I mean, also, there's moral reasons, but he was also okay with the data. That's why Edward Green said the Pope may be right. Yes? Are there any good locations that um, are good examples of seeing the risk compensation effect? Because I imagine with most places using an ABC effect, because you include A and B, that probably mitigates the risk compensation effect that you would see. Are there any places that only promote condoms that you can actually see the quantification of how much that effect takes place? There are, um, there are papers. Um, I think it's Norman Hurst, H-E-A-R-S-T. You can look for him in Google. They made analyses in Africa and they showed that where more, where the strongest condom promotion messages were undertaken, they had higher rates of HIV at the end. But uh, what I hope to do with our data is to be able to show with follow-up data, longitudinal data, not cross-sectional like I showed you, uh, to show with cross-sectional, with longitudinal data that, yes, kids that think condoms are 100% effective feel less vulnerable and thus have sex earlier and have more sexual partners. But that's on the way. For the moment, we have the cross-sectional data because, of course, all the AIDS establishment, what they say is that there is no such thing as risk compensation. What they do sometimes is they show you a, a study showing there is no difference. But whoever studies statistics know that the absence of difference doesn't mean there is no difference. It could mean there is no difference. It could mean you don't have enough statistical power to detect a difference. You need to design the study to show uh, equality, for example. Yes? Just a comment, I, our country here, we are standing on the brink of uh, free contraception for all. And uh, I would just make the point that uh, free contraception is not equally effective to contraception that you pay for. As a matter of fact, with risk compensation, it is less effective, significantly less effective when you don't have skin in the game, pardon my... Uh, but you know, if you don't pay for it, you're less likely to use it correctly. That's true. It has to do with motivation. It has to do with also SES related to the user and knowledge. But I don't. I social economic status. But I didn't know the meaning of brink. Oh, brink. What's we're, that? We're standing. Okay. At the end of the you're heading towards that. Yeah. Is that what it means? Edge of a cliff. Oh, okay. Okay, you're right there. Okay. <laughs> contraception in this country usually they're talking about steroidal contraception uh, we're uh, working on a study now uh, putting together all the international data now there's very good longitudinal data showing that in particular injectable uh, progestins uh, increase the risk by at least 50 percent and these are studies where they would take uh, married couples and look at them uh, every few months where they know that one is seropositive and the other is not. So very good data on, uh, on uh, who is actually positive, what the exposure is. And the mechanism is also pretty clear because the high dose progestin uh, keeps the va vaginal epithelium very thin and the presence of uh, virus, increased presence of the virus can be shown man to woman, woman to man same thing and this is another message that the public health establishment is pushing oh yes we need effective uh, uh, contraception and so they under the radar of the condoms they're, they're pushing the steroidal contraceptives and they are certainly a, one of the major contributors to all of the uh, uh, prevalence international uh, prevalence yes, of AIDS. Yes and there is another issue that I haven't uh, 
read about it a lot in the medical literature, but those of us who work in NFP um, know about this. The cervical fluid has lysozymes, you pronounce that like that, lysozymes, which is antivirus and bacterial too. Um, hormones block uh, the production, may block the production of cervical fluid, and that in turn could influence also the vulnerability to infections. Yeah. What's the reaction of the international community to the successes in Uganda, specifically um, like funding organizations like um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? The reaction is um, to continue saying that this is a religious issue. This is a religious bias. United Nations, UNAIDS, they started picking up the information, which means that, in truth, they really think there is an issue there. They're collecting data. But in the street, in the discussions, official writings of UNAIDS, they don't stress the issue.